morning, everybody. Comrades, brothers and sisters from the NTUC, a good morning once again. I'm very happy to join all of you here in person today for our party convention. And also a very warm welcome to our comrades who are participating virtually with us all over Singapore in our 93 party branches. Welcome to you all. We are very honored to have with us brothers and sisters from the labor movement joining us again today. The labor movement has stood shoulder to shoulder with the PAP in this crisis, helping workers and families, engaging employers to preserve jobs, keeping a finger on the pulse so we know how things are going. Ours is a symbiotic relationship with the NTUC. I talked about this in the party conference last year and again at the May Day rally a few months ago. So I fully support what Brother Sanjeev Tiwari said just now about continually reinforcing the bonds between the NTUC and the PAP. I look forward to party and union activists doing much more together advocating side by side with each other and making sure that workers at all levels feel and appreciate the value of this partnership. We've been fighting COVID-19 now for almost two years. It's been a long journey with many twists and turns. The virus has surprised us over and over again and repeatedly we've had to adapt our response, pick ourselves up, and then press on. It's been tough on everyone, not least on our healthcare and frontline workers who've been working tirelessly to keep us safe. And once again, we thank them all. Also, a very big thank you to all the party activists who have been reaching out to help residents in need during these difficult times. Some of you took physical care of residents. For example, in Tampanese North, where volunteers distributed support packs to people recovering from home. Other branches attended to people's well-being, mental well-being which is a serious worry during these stressful times. Especially for the elderly, for example, Kolam Ai volunteers taught seniors to use smartphones to stay connected with their families. And also the mental well-being of the young. So the young PAP worked with youths to improve their mental health and their resilience at homes and also in schools. These last two years have tested not just our healthcare response, but also our social bonds and our political will. I'm grateful that in a crunch, Singaporeans have stayed united, worked closely with the government, and come together to support one another. Overall, we've come a long way. We've made a lot of progress but we must still be prepared for more bumps along the road. Right now, a new variant of concern is emerging. We new, learned a new word, the Omicron variant. We are tracking this very closely. We are not sure yet, but we may well be forced to take a few steps back before we can take more steps forward. But despite all this, that I'm confident that we'll find our way to living with the virus and safely resume all the things that we love to do. We are making all this effort because we want to get there safely with as few casualties along the way as possible. Every crisis is a test of trust. In a public health crisis like COVID-19, we all rely on trusted sources 
to explain things to us and to advise us what we need to do. Most of us are not doctors and scientists, and even doctors and scientists have difficulty keeping up with a flood of new knowledge, science, about the virus, how it behaves, how to treat it, what is likely to happen next. So people look to the government to assess the situation, judge what to do, and organize a national response. The whole country must work as one, but it's a government that must decide what to do and lead the country forward. One big reason our measures against COVID-19 are working is because Singaporeans trust the PAP government. They trust that the PAP government will keep everyone safe and keep Singapore in working order. That if people catch COVID-19, they'll get proper medical treatment. That if we have a lockdown, affected workers and businesses will be taken care of. That supermarkets will be stocked and essential services will not be disrupted. Singaporeans have this confidence because for 60 years now, we've had consistent, functioning, good PAP government. They know the PAP will never give up in a crisis. We won't buckle. We'll always have your back. So as a result, Singaporeans patiently complied with burdensome safe management measures and repeated rounds of tightening and then easing and then tightening again, and then easing again. They accepted that the tightenings were essential to slow down infections at critical moments and prevent our healthcare system from being overwhelmed. They understood that the changes in plans were hard to avoid because in a rapidly changing situation, we have to adapt our response as the situation unfolds. I'm very glad that everyone came together, accepted the inconveniences and hardships, and made our measures work. Thank you, everybody. When vaccines became available, Singaporeans came forward to get their vaccinations without any hesitation. It's been a very successful campaign to vaccinate everyone. Today, 87% of the population is fully vaccinated, probably one of the highest vaccination rates anywhere in the world. And it's not just because the vaccination campaign was well organized or because the vaccinations were for free. In fact, in some vaccination centers, you've got goodie bags. It was also because people trusted the government, trusted the healthcare system, and accepted advice to get vaccinated, to protect yourself, to protect your families. Elsewhere, the situation is often quite different. Some countries have had great difficulties vaccinating their whole population. Europe is now struggling with a fourth wave of infections. Vaccines are readily available, but a significant minority in every country simply refuse to get vaccinated. Many of them are anti-vaxxers, not just because they are misguided or ignorant, but because of deep distrust, distrust of authority in general and of their own governments in particular. So when the governments try to persuade them to get vaccinated, their response is, I don't trust you. Why should I believe you? Why should I listen to you? That's in Europe. But it's also a very big problem in the US. Their attitudes towards the vaccination split along partisan political lines between the blue camp, the Democrats, and the red camps, the Republicans. 
the Democrat supporters are eager to get jabbed and willing to wear masks to protect themselves and others. But many Republicans still remain unvaccinated. Even in red states, meaning states which vote Republican, red states where they're having new outbreaks, many people seriously ill, large numbers in ICU and dying. And this is weird because the previous Republican administration was the one who pushed to get vaccines invented, tested, confirmed, deployed, and now Republicans don't want it. But essentially, it's because the Americans are profoundly divided, because the public health care is politicized, and on top of that, there's deep suspicion of the government. These political divisions and social distrust have made it harder for the US and European countries to bring COVID-19 under control. In Singapore, we are very fortunate we have not had such divisions in our society. But remember, we did not become a cohesive, trusting society overnight. Social cohesion is a work of decades. And trust had to build, be built up long before the crisis. When a crisis strikes, if the trust is not already there, then it's already too late. I'm very grateful that the PAP government enjoys the public's trust, built up over years of working closely with Singaporeans. We've been delivering faithfully on promises. We've been consistently producing results for people. Housing, health care, well-paying jobs, better lives. We've shown year in, year out, in good times and bad, in crisis after crisis, that the PAP government will always be there, with you, for you, for Singapore. And indeed, during this crisis, we've had to draw upon this reservoir of trust because we've faced many urgent and difficult decisions that impact lives and livelihoods. To impose a circuit breaker or not, to close schools or not, to let patients with mild symptoms recover at home or not, to allow dining at F&B outlets or not, to open up our borders or not. In an ideal world, we'd have all the relevant information we can decide, and then what we decide will work and things will unfold as we expect, and everyone can be kept ha happy. But in the real world, uncertainties, surprises, and trade-offs, choices, are unavoidable. Whatever we decide, however hard we try to get it right and to cushion the impact, more often than not, some group will be affected or disappointed, and it cannot be helped. We will do our best, but these are hard choices. And yet, still, the government must exercise its judgment to the best of its ability and carry Singaporeans along. But as I told the ministers, in a crisis, as leaders, we cannot afford to waver. It is not the time to worry about being popular or looking good. You have been elected for one purpose, and you have to focus on your duty to make the right decision, keep Singapore safe, and see Singapore and Singaporeans through this crisis. Concentrate on that, get the job done. That's why Singaporeans elected us, and that is our sacred trust. 
Just as importantly, as we strive to do the right thing, we must continue to refresh and nurture this trust that people have in us. And what does that mean? It means we've got to deal competently with the problems, solve them, explain clearly what we are doing and why and where we are headed. And so we hold regular press conferences and quite often I have a national broadcast to speak to people directly so they can understand what we are trying to do and feel whether we know what we are doing. And everybody understands our considerations and game plan and will be psychologically prepared for what is to come. We have to be open and transparent to share what we know, admit what we do not know. We have to announce bad news as well as good news. Report what has gone right, but also acknowledge what has not gone right, what has gone wrong, and will be put right. We have to lead by example. In Singapore, we take this for granted, but it's very important and it's worth reminding ourselves of this point. The same rules apply to everybody. Safe distancing, mask wearing, testing and isolation requirements. You may be minister or MP, community leader or safe distancing ambassador. You abide by the same rules, whoever you may be. I emphasize this because if you read the newspapers or the internet, you can see how things have gone wrong in other places where leaders abuse their positions. It undermines public trust, it demolishes the credibility and the standing of the government, and the damage done goes well beyond COVID-19. So it's a reminder to us all that the same rules apply to everybody and never, never take advantage and misuse your position of response, authority and leadership. Trust is important not just between Singaporeans and their leaders. We must be able to trust one another as well as citizens. Rules and penalties are necessary, but it's not enough. We rely on everyone to exercise personal and social responsibility. For example, maintaining good personal hygiene in public places, exercising due care and discretion when participating in high-risk activities, complying with the safe management measures. We have to trust one another to abide by the spirit of the rules and not just the letter of the rules and to comply even when nobody is checking. For example, if we are under an isolation protocol and we're supposed to self-test before we go out and encounter other people, then we have to do it honestly and truthfully and self-declare the, self the results. And if the results are not what we hope to see, you have to do what you need to do. So that, and we have to be like this so that the government doesn't have to seal every last possible loophole and we can treat people as honourable citizens who are responsible, who will take care of not just ourselves, but also of the welfare of others. We must trust our collective spirit as one people, looking out for one another, supporting those in greater need staying united in a crisis. Singapore cannot claim to have better doctors or scientists or better health care than US or Europe. But the decisive difference in our response is this. We trust one another, therefore we work with one another and not against one another. COVID-19 has been a searching test of public trust for societies all around the world. Some societies are high trust, others are low trust, and it makes all the difference in a crisis. Singapore is 
and must always be a high-trust society. We've kept faith with one another. We must always do so. And that's the way to weather not just COVID-19, but future storms that will come our way. To remain a high-trust society, we've got to get our politics right. Because only then will our system deliver results for Singaporeans, and that will give Singaporeans good reason to trust the government and trust one another. Politics is about people's lives and futures, and it carries on even during a pandemic. We have to continue addressing people's concerns and striving towards our aspiration of a fair and inclusive society, where every Singaporean has the opportunity to seek a better life for themselves and their children, where every citizen is accepted and valued, no matter what his background or station in life. And that's why, even as we tackle COVID-19, we have pressed on with important goals. We are improving social mobility, bringing every kid to a good starting point in life with Kid Start, Uplift, and many other programs, opening more pathways for people to improve and upgrade themselves and renew their skills with Skills Future. At the same time, we are redoubling efforts to strengthen social cohesion and prevent divisive issues from splitting us. We are fostering stronger race relations and tackling racial discrimination. We are empowering women's development and improving their standing in society. We are acknowledging and dealing with tensions between Singaporeans and migrant workers, work pass holders. We are ensuring fair opportunities at workplaces with anti-discrimination legislation. These are long-term endeavours and results will take time, but we are moving in the right direction and we are making progress. And yet, having good policies alone is not enough. We must help people appreciate how these policies make a difference in their lives. We must, people, we must inspire people with an ideals and the values behind these policies. We must mobilize everyone in order to realize our common vision for Singapore. And we have to help Singaporeans to make that political connection. All these good things, social mobility, better jobs and better lives, they don't happen just by themselves. In many countries, they don't happen at all. If you want to continue to get good results in Singapore, we've got to get our politics right. You have to support the PAP government, and we must work together to build a nation that we aspire towards. All this means the PAP must remain politically on top. A new generation of voters want to see more debate, more contestation, more questioning of established ideas. They want their voices heard, as you heard from Comrade Nadia Samdin just now. And it is understandable, and the PAP must respond to this. Show Singaporeans we are not afraid of opposing views or of being challenged. We encourage healthy discourse. We welcome good ideas, wherever they may come from. And just as importantly, we listen carefully to the opinions and concerns of Singaporeans. And that's why this year we've been holding conversations on women's developments. That's why the Emerging Stronger Task Force has been working hard with different groups, setting up alliances for action, many. That's why this year we made the decision to allow nurses in public hospitals to wear the tudong. After extensive consultations and careful deliberations, 
stretching over many years. We listen, we consider, we make up our minds, taking everybody's views into account, and we try and hold everyone together as we move ahead. Our aim is to bring people together, understand the problems, and stay connected in order to co-create the right solutions to co-build tomorrow's Singapore. At the same time, political discourse is not just a matter of accepting or marketing good ideas. We also have to rebut wrong views, if possible, gently, but when necessary, firmly. And we have to expose those who, for their own reasons and political purposes, try to exploit issues to confuse people and to make them unhappy. That was the spirit of the recent debates in Parliament on the seeker and the work pass holders to explain our policies, to make things clear, to get people to make the connection and understand how these policies benefit Singapore, actually benefit Singaporean workers. But at the same time, to demolish the people who are trying to exploit these issues for political advantage, so that Singaporeans are not misled, not made use of, not led in the wrong direction, which will do them harm. I tell my younger colleagues, in politics, if you are not able to hold your own, stand up, argue your case, and retain the support of voters, you are finished. You may have noble intentions and good ideas, but if you can't get re-elected, you can't do anything about them, and you won't be able to do good for Singapore. Finally, on politics, I would add one more important point. The reason why politics has delivered result for Singaporeans depends on one critical factor, our emphasis on integrity and honesty. If politicians are venal or dishonest, you tell lies or you're corrupt, you take money, politicians cannot be trusted. Voters will not trust your motives, cannot take what you say at face value, people will become disillusioned and cynical. And they will lose faith, not just from individual leaders or political parties, but from the political system in the whole, as a whole, from the political class as a whole. They despair of the system. They give up hope on their country. The country is in a bad state. You cannot recover, and trust is forever destroyed. There are too many examples of this happening far away from us, as well as nearby to us. And we must never, never, never let that happen to Singapore. In Singapore, people expect MPs and political leaders to be clean, to be above reproach in their personal conduct to be scrupulously truthful in what they say, inside Parliament or outside Parliament. The PAP has upheld these stringent standards ever since it came into power more than 60 years ago in 1959. All our ministers, MPs and activists know this. If someone misbehaves, misspeaks, we will discipline him. If someone misspeaks, he will put it right because he knows that's the right thing to do and the party will insist on it. The PAP's rigour sets the tone for Singapore politics and voters have to apply these same standards of integrity and honesty to every group and every person who participates in politics and public life, whichever side he may be on because otherwise we are signalling that we are prepared to lower standards and this will eventually drag our system down.
Because politics is so important, the PAP must always be a vigorous and an effective party that Singaporeans can trust and then can lead Singapore forward. Our party machinery must be well oiled and always ready to go. Our party leadership must be continually renewed, always fit to lead the party and lead Singapore. And we have to do three things in order to achieve this. Firstly, we have to strengthen the capabilities of every party branch. Because so if we do that, we want every activist in every branch and at every rung to be fully equipped to do their best as ambassadors of the party. We've been conducting party political training at the HQ for some time now. Many activists and branch chairmen have participated in these training sessions. We will scale up the training and sharing of best practices across our branches, learn from one another, raise our standards. Friendly competition will bring the best out of us. We will also tap on our experienced veterans who have much to share to mentor and guide our newer members. Strengthening branches will make us more effective on the ground. Our activists need to be visible, to be seen wearing party whites from time to time, not just during elections. You must be active in engaging residents to win the support and trust of residents because they will see you as the face of the PAP and of the government. Secondly, we have to update party comms and outreach. The party has been reinventing itself in the digital age. We've been rethinking, reorganizing, and repackaging how we deliver party comms. We need to improve our outreach and use digital platforms more effectively. We need to meet the electorate where they are, whether they are on social media or on other platforms. And this is especially critical during a general election campaign. We just launched patir.sg. It's a new socio-political website of the PAP, the digital counterpart of the Patir newsletter. It will deliver our party updates to a wider audience. I hope comrades will find it interesting and relevant. Please help us to spread the message. Share the articles and stories with friends and residents. Explain to your contacts and your colleagues why the party took certain decisions or actions or policy positions, how these will make a difference to your lives. Thirdly, we need to renew and reinforce our party leadership. We are always on the, new, on the lookout for new members who share the values and the goals of the PAP. In particular, we continue to welcome people of diverse backgrounds so that they can better serve residents and voters who are also getting more diverse, as Comrade Goziki reminded us just now. I hope to see many more people come in, all walks of life, all experiences, many different views, as long as you support Singapore and want to do good for Singapore with a pure heart. We must also, therefore, renew our party with fresh ideas and youthful vigour. I'm very glad that we have such people working in our branches, participating in the grassroots, and joining us for the convention today. Comrade Goziki was one of them. Comrade Ling Wei Hong, serving in Sengkang Central, was another. We hear from them, we are inspired by them. We hope they will attract more people like them to join us. <laughs> Comrade Ling Wei Hong is in Sengkang Central. Is an opposition constituency. He has a tough task. As he explained to you, they can't do the work of the MPs, but they are there to work the ground, make their presence felt, and keep the opposition MPs on their toes. 
Patiently, they will win the confidence of voters and win the constituency back. It, will, it may take time, but we will do it, and we will give them our full support. We need to recruit a new generation of party members with the staying power, commitment and conviction of our old stalwarts. Like our late comrade Lionel D'Souza, whom we honoured with a posthumous commendation award just now. He served with tireless dedication for many years in our Kang. He was fearless in his support for the party and for Singapore. Every time I met him, it gave me heart. We have people with a conviction with a passion, the staying power. It's tough. You may, be, may, you may have doors closed in your faces. You may not persuade people overnight to change their views, but you keep on trying and trying and trying. And in the case of Comrade Lionel, he kept on trying right to the end when he passed away. We need people like that. Today, we also honoured Comrade Ku Tsai Ki, who has received the Meritorious Service Medal. He came in 30 years ago, first as a backbencher, then as an office holder, now retired a whole 10 years now. He keeps active in Tanjung Paga GRC, helping the party, helping residents, helping Singapore. Thank you, Tsai Ki. This is the spirit and the passion that we must kindle in the next generation. Always loyal, always reliable, always serving the people. We Ren Min Fu. We hope that from party activists old and new, we will find many promising ones to field as candidates in future elections. We are already expanding our touch points and starting our recruitment process and we have many tea sessions lined up, which is an encouraging sign because it shows strong interest in the party, in the platform, and more importantly, it shows that many Singaporeans are willing to step forward to serve the country and to fight for the Singapore which they believe in. We need renewal not only amongst MPs or branch secretaries, but also ministers, and the Prime Minister too. The pandemic has delayed my succession plans. In April this year, one Assistant Secretary General, Comrade Heng Sui Kiat, announced that he would step aside as leader of the 4G team. But as DPM, Sui Kiat remains a key member of the 4G team, carrying heavy responsibilities, especially for the economy. The 4G ministers have since re-looked at the issue of succession. They've said this before, and I repeat what they say, it's not about selecting a boss or the winner of a race. It's not a reality show. It's deadly serious life and death decisions for Singaporeans. It's about developing a strong team and settling amongst themselves a primus inter pares, a first amongst equals, one who can bring others together and bring out the best from every member of the team. COVID-19 has been a stern test for the 4G. It's tested their resolve both individually and collectively. The whole 4G team deserves a lot of credit for managing the COVID-19 situation. This is a leadership team that Singapore can depend on and trust in good times and tough times. I ask all party members to give them your full support to work with you and to take the nation through the next bound. As the situation stabilizes, Settling on my successor 
will be an important matter which cannot be put off indefinitely. The 4G team will need a little longer to make a decision, but I'm confident that they will settle it well before the next general election comes around. We haven't decided on the date of the next general election yet, but I'm confident they'll settle it in good time before that. And I'm sure they'll make a wise choice and that in due course, I'll be able to hand over the nation into good hands. Our journey ahead will not be short of fresh challenges, but it is the PAP's responsibility to continue to lead the nation and to strengthen the public's trust in us. COVID-19 is an immediate and ongoing crisis, but it won't be the last. When the next crisis comes along, it's my hope that the trust between Singaporeans and the PAP will have been strengthened by how we have gone through this crisis together. And come what may, whatever happens in future, Singapore will be all the stronger and prepared to deal with whatever comes. I urge every party member to continue serving our people to the best of your ability, in good times and bad. Give your hearts and souls to representing the needs and aspirations of Singaporeans. Listen to their concerns. Give voice to their needs. Empathize with their lived experiences. Flag issues which they want attended to. At the same time, continue to be advocates for the PAP government. Help to explain our policies to the people. More than that, get them to embrace the motives behind these policies, the values we uphold, and the Singapore we seek to create together. Through your actions and efforts, earn the trust of Singaporeans over and over again. As Singapore continues to progress, our task does not end. We must keep on upholding our values, rallying people behind us, so that Singapore can emerge stronger as one into a brighter post-COVID future. Thank you very much.